For the Los Angeles Review of Books, I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from LARB headquarters here in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, speaking with Richard Kramer, whose first novel is recently out, These Things Happen, it's called. But you'll also know him from his work in television writing and producing shows like 30-something, Once and Again, Tales of the City, and My So-Called Life. And if you're a LARB reader, which I hope you are, you'll have seen the thousands of tweets and hopefully followed them to read his piece on how good Pauline Kael was to him early on. Richard, in, in these things happen, we have a question that confronts a few of the main characters, and it's, it's a question some of them didn't even realize was important until asked it. And the question is, when did you know? And in this case, these characters, these men, when did they know that they were homosexual? Mm-hmm. And I wonder, I'll, I'll ask you about that question, when did you know you were going to write a novel involving that question? Well, I, you know, I didn't really know that I was going to write a novel involving that question until I was about halfway through it. Mm. And, um, you know, in early forms of the story, there are two questions that animate the book and that become, you know, like little snowballs that wind up almost crushing everybody uh, by the time they, they, they're at the bottom of the hill at the end of the book, which is when did you know – uh, in this case, specifically, it said you were homosexual. And do you think being homosexual or being gay, which is the same thing, is a choice? And I was not particularly interested in the answers to those questions. And I'm not haunted by those questions in my own life. Uh, but as I've thought about the book, you know, it's funny, you write a book and then you think you know everything about it while you're working on it. And you think, you know, that you can never release it because you have so much more to say. Then you do let it out. And then you start to see what it was you were really writing about. Mm. And I think that to be conscious, too conscious, I can now say this having written a book, to be too conscious while you're in the process of composing it gets in your way. I think you have to in a way, work from instinct, which is the hardest part about it. Mm. Uh, the hardest part um, is is not the size of it. The hardest part is the not knowing, mm. which is one of the themes in the book. But but in terms of the question, when did you know? The that applies to every single character in the book, and it has. It, sometimes it has to do with sexuality, and sometimes it has to do with other things. But the book is about identity. Mm. And the book is about how our identities are always changing, always shifting, and how can you know when you've reached the point that it is who you are and who you can count on? Mm. And so the boy who is asking this question is not a gay kid. He is much more interested in the larger picture of identity, which I think most teenagers and most people are. Mm. How do I know that I'm me? How do I know that I can count on the me that I am to be there consistently? Mm-hmm. So it's about becoming. It is about, you know, owning yourself. And it is about becoming comfortable with what you find out about yourself. Mm-hmm. And these, this, this kid you mentioned who asks this question of his, of his father and his father's partner, this kid Wesley, he's 15, He's in New York, modern day New York. So, so the book has a lot of texting. We can we can lay that out right now. And you you, you write well about texting, and it's something that novelists are often afraid of. Maybe we'll touch on that later. But this book, this is the first novel I've read that pl- that involves texting in a plausible way <laughs> to such a degree. So, congratulations. But Wesley, Wesley is a kid who I mean, we can call him a, a, a privileged kid and a smart one as well. And we we can say that he's searching for an identity like every teenager. We all remember that, but this is a kid whom you, you first start reading about him and you think, oh, he's listen to how he talks with his friend. He's so smart. He's, he, his, his, he comes from a supportive family, sometimes almost too supportive to me. He's, he'll, be, he'll be okay, right? I mean, this is, this is a kid who seems like he'll definitely be fine no matter what right at the beginning, no? Well, yes and no. Mm-hmm. Uh, privilege is a funny word here. Um, because I think that he is um, what I was very much, you know, this is something interesting we went through on 30 something, which was uh, our critics, and we had a lot of them, used to say these are a bunch of spoiled, whining yuppies. Oh, that kind of privileged. Oh, another sense of the word than the one I used it in. Other kind of, yes. And so it's not that I'm I'm hypersensitive about that, but to me, Wesley, the last thing he was was spoiled. Mm. And that's not the word that you used. But I think he's privileged in the sense that he is surrounded by people, by adults particularly, 
who mostly want the best for him. Mm -hmm. They want the best for him through their own lenses. <laughs> yes. But that's, I think, everybody's parents. Mm -hmm. And he is privileged in the fact that he, you know, has a, a comfortable place to live. He has a good school to go to. He has people who are uh, uh, dedicated to to furthering his passions and interests. But he's not privileged in other ways. Mm. It's it's a mix. And when you say that 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 you felt from the start, um, I, I hope that that changed as the story went on. Right, because only he, in the start. Yeah, only in the start. That's very important because we see the jeopardy that he is in fact in. Right. Um, uh, and I don't want to, uh, you know, quote unquote, give, you know, spoiler alert. I'm not going to spoil anything, but there is a character in the book who I'm sure we will talk about, um, who I think is the source of Wesley's, um, fundamental salvation mm. by the end of the book. Without him, I think this kid would be more screwed. Mm. What are the, what are the, the dangers of writing a sharp, a sharp kid who comes from a supportive family. I, and, and there's a danger to writing every character. There's a pitfall everywhere. What are the pitfalls of a Wesley that you want to avoid when you're writing him? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question from, from several directions. There was a, 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 a well-known novelist who, who um, was supportive of the book and, and very nice to me about it. And who said to me, my favorite thing that anyone has said, he said, you have succeeded at the impossible task of writing a book about nice people <laughs> <laughs> i see hard to have a, hard to have a conflict when everybody is nice though isn't it well they're not always that nice yes. they pretend to be nice <laughs> um they pretend to be nice and it's not because they're evil i, I don't want to jump to the end again they pretend to be nice because they they like that picture of themselves mm -hmm. as nice and supportive and you know i think one of the things that I discovered while I was writing this is that, that I am like that, that there are certain pictures of myself that I hold that I don't want challenged because I like seeing myself that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking of the ways in which that's true for every character in the book. I'm now going, going through all of them. And, and in, in the character of Wesley's father, Kenny, we have a man who's a, a lawyer, but also a media personality where he's, there are ways he wants to see himself, but his whole job is to be seen a certain way, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Kenny is is uh, uh, a challenging character for uh, a number of people, a number of readers, and and I am always most gratified uh, when somebody says to me, you know, at first I didn't get him, and then I did. Mm. Kenny is somebody who is – he came out after his marriage. I mean his wife did not leave him because he was gay. She left him because she fell in love with another guy who was warmer and more supportive of her mm. and her child. Mm. And she, I think, made a very wise choice. And Kenny, once he came out, carried with him – a shadow of shame is how I put it. And I'm not even totally connecting to the fact that he was secretly, to whatever degree it was secret, that he was secretly gay. He is somebody who was born uncomfortable in his own skin. And he is really, really tormented by that. And he does everything. He's a genuinely good person who does genuinely good things because he hopes that it will make him feel better about himself and it doesn't. Mm. So he is in this utter state of confusion. How can he be a better person than he is? You know, I describe him as, you know, George, his partner, describes him as the straight acting face of all things gay and good <laughs> in New York. And, you know, he's the guy Charlie Rose calls on to sit at the table because he is presentable. Right. He's also extremely effective and he still feels like shit about mm -hmm. himself. And I am not saying that that's because of internalized homophobia. I hope that the book is more interesting than that. Mm -hmm. This is one of those people in life who simply is uneasy in his own skin mm -hmm. and made that much more so when his child moves in because his child is going to see this too. Mm -hmm. That's his biggest secret is that he doesn't think people like him mm -hmm. and they don't. <laughs> Worse yet, they don't. They don't. Hmm. Because he's one of those guys who walks into a room where everybody's having a good time and it goes quiet. Wow. And he can't figure out why. So my heart breaks for him. Hmm. 
Now, you you do have, of course, in the novel, a character who who likes Kenny very much, which is his partner, George. Yes. And he comes from a different place, you might say, very than Kenny. So. He He's not a lawyer. He's a, he's a former theater actor who one day... Of course, boy. Of course, boy. Yeah. One day realized, no more theater for me. And he's, he operates an Italian restaurant in the theater district now. Yes. And they they might be seen in some sense by readers as an odd couple at first. But it, you get the sense that, that it makes sense... Though I couldn't quite articulate to you why I think that coupling makes sense. Well, it, it, it felt right to me. And I think that, that for one thing, the problem the, that they don't realize that they have, that the events of the book bring to light are the fact that they are in a relationship where they have long since stopped questioning what its nature is and have settled into a kind of stale coziness in which neither of them are thriving. Mm-hmm. Hardly a hardly a homosexual only problem. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And you know, one of the things, just to 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 take a tiny step to the side, is that one of the things that makes me nuts in how some people react to the book is that this is regarded as a a statement about the gay and lesbian parenting situation, which it isn't. <laughs> it absolutely isn't. This is about a family now in New York struggling to keep its head above water. As the world floods, uh, to, just to keep that metaphor going, you know, I was going to say as the ground shifts beneath their feet, but that yes. doesn't, you know, keep you, you don't keep your head above water if the ground is shifting beneath your feet. <laughs> but, at, but as, you know, as there's a tidal wave of change mm. and, and they're all struggling to hold on to something so they're not swept away. Mm. And so on, on Amazon, you know, where I have, you know, wonderful reviews and they've been wonderful, they listed under books about gay and lesbian parenting as mm-hmm. if it was a manual. This is an anti-manual <laughs> for that. You know, I mean, the, 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 the gay parent in here isn't, is he's fundamentally a nightmare. Mm. And, you know, the being in the gay couple, you know, almost kills the kid. Mm. Um, but um, uh, George, his partner is on the, on the surface, like I've said before, a lightweight. Um, I actually said that to you before we started rolling. But but uh, here's this. It, 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 on the surface, an odd couple, but each has something that the other really wants. Mm. Kenny has gravitas and George has lightness. Mm. And uh, Kenny actually has less gravitas than he seems to have. And George actually has less lightness than he seems to have. But each believes that the other completes him, to quote that awful <laughs> quote, uh, even though they're not conscious about that. And uh, I don't think that they're the world's best couple, but who is the world's best couple? Right. And they are are committed to each other without question. They love each other without question. Should they be together? That is not questioned in the start of the book, and it is very questioned by the end. And without the presence of Wesley in the household, that never would have happened. Mm. You know, there's a there's a you know uh, a Hebrew uh, in in the Passover service. You know, it's a famous thing. It's Manish Tana, which means is why is this night different from all other nights? And I, I, I felt that this story needed that. I mean, there would be. This, the nights of the story would not be different than any other nights without the presence of Wesley in mm. the apartment. Mm. And, and he brings a light with him that shines into every corner of everybody's life. And he does, he does it without even knowing that he's doing it, but it gets more and more bright. Mm. And he's always asking questions. So there's an overt element as well absolutely, to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. The book is about, you know, I, I was, uh, oh, away for the weekend in a wonderful bookstore in Cambridge. And I was looking at all the fabulous book covers and all the jacket illustrations. And I had an idea for the paperback of this when it comes out is I wanted something to play off of the motif of the question mark, Mm -hmm. the shape of the question mark, because this book is about questions and what, what the the right question can do to an unquestioned situation, Mm -hmm. how it is can, it can foster a revolution. Mm. And I was lucky enough to find the quote at the very beginning from, from uh, E.E. E. Cummings. I, let me not screw it up. Give me the book and I'll read it to you. Sure. But uh, it just, I, there it was one day. And I, the, the, the epigraph is, 
always the beautiful answer who asks a more beautiful question. Hmm. And that plays through the book. Because the question that, fleshing back to what you said before, is when did you know? The questions that are posed innocently at the beginning assume force and weight by the end and throws everything in the book into question. Hmm. You know, when I think of questions posed innocently in great number, you think of a much younger child than 15, but here we have Wesley asking these questions very articulately. The, the kid is, again, a smart kid, but he's he, he, he lets loose with his questions in a way that you don't expect from somebody that age. You, you, even, even the parents here bring up that they, when he shuts down a little more, they, they bring up that they expected teenagers to be shut down in some sense. And, oh, that's, that's right. He's, he's more like a teenager now that later in the book, certain events lead him to turn inward and to communicate a little less with, with them, with his actual parents. Well, you know, remember that, first of all, that the questions are not his, but they're his friends. Indeed. Which who we haven't introduced yet. So no, he's, there, there's a reason he asks these questions. There yeah. is absolutely a reason, but he's also asking them for himself. I mean, he's not somebody without interests of his own. Right. Um, but he – the last thing I wanted for him to be is to be a precocious little brat. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think that he is. Right. Uh, and, you know, he – particularly, you know, as things get worse, becomes more and more of a sullen teenager who tortures his parents. And I was always very, I just sort of sat back and sort of watched those scenes write themselves because I was amused to see his, his, how expert he was at it. Mm. Uh, he holds, and again, let's not jump ahead, but, but he holds back something that he knows they very much want to know. Mm. And 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 is in complete charge of the situation, which is different than being precocious. Right, right. It's 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 a precocious a precocious, a precocious kid doesn't usually have much power necessarily. No, he discovers his power mm. within this story. He feels powerless, discovers power, discovers what power means, mm. and discovers a way to use it productively. Mm. Whether he's conscious of that or not, and I don't care if he's conscious of it or not, because, you know, I was writing something, um, uh, I was telling you early about the gay character on Downton Abbey, and I, I say in the piece that, that every time that character, whose name is Thomas, becomes lustful or sexual, he seems to be vampiric. <laughs> and I said... I'm not sure that the actor even knows that he's doing that. And it's often better when they don't know. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's true about characters too, is that, um, and I, I might bring this in from my experience as a dramatist and as a screenwriter. I think it's my experience in life mm -hmm. is that, that the less conscious we are of what we're doing, the more authentic we're being to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a, a line toward the end George thinks about from his theater days, which is, well, it's don't think. As it boils down to don't think, right? Yes. As you were saying when you write, just write, don't think, just well, act, that's, don't that's think. That's advice from uh, Ed Zwick, um, who, which which changed my life. Um, uh, during thirty something, um, I was having some trouble on some script, and he came into my office. He said, "Richard, just don't think." Mm. And this is from someone a very cerebral. You know, very, you know, uh, just say an intellectual person who who knew that you have to get out of your own way. And thinking is the obstacle that you put in front of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I think for some reason, whenever I he hear about Edward, Z Edward Zwick, I think of his uh, film, The Last Samurai. Yes. And uh, there's 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 that element where the main Tom Cruise character has to embrace that that un the, the the unthinking in the old word would be oriental side yeah. of his side of his side of his action. You know what I mean? I, I forget the movie in in some parts, but some parts I remember very distinctly. Well, the thing that's a great reference, because in The Last Samurai, what, what he learns to do and why I think the last sequence of it is so moving is is he learns to just move forward. Mm. Even as they, you know, as the Japanese government is is shooting him with Gatling guns, he learns that the code of the samurai is you simply do your job, which is to move forward. And that's a precept of Ed's in life. And, and it affected me very much. Mm -hmm. And I think that that probably paid off um, in ways in the book. And that's one of the reasons the book is dedicated to him. Mm -hmm. 
we've mentioned this best friend of of Wesley's, yeah. his 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 friend who has him ask these questions of of his father and his father's partner. When did you know? Because this friend uh, has has recently himself realized that he is gay, and in 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 a in an accept, acceptance speech for the class uh, presidency or school school presidency or class presidency 10th grade presidency, 10th grade presidency he announces off the cuff that he uh, in his words is a gay guy and quite frankly we, quite frankly a gay guy yes quite, yes quite frankly a gay guy when is the is this the first time that that could plausibly happen in a book you could write a book where a 15 year old does that how how long has that been thinkable well great question because two weeks ago that happened, and it was much, you know, uh, uh, Googled, YouTubed, Twittered, reported. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a 15-year-old boy came out in an assembly and, you know, received nothing but accolades for it. And mm-hmm. it helped that he was cute, <laughs> as it always helps when you're yes, cute. as always. Um, and if he had not been cute, I think it might not have been picked up. And the, a lot of the response was how cute he was. Mm-hmm. But he did it. The incident of a kid coming out in a school assembly was told to me by a friend 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was uh, a kid who went to a a a private high school in New York, private school in New York, and who was um, 16 when he did it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, when I was uh, having dinner with a friend of mine and his partner, you know, six months ago, he said, what's your book about it? And I said, it's based on so-and-so who came out and so-and-so. And my friend's partner said, oh, I was there that day. <laughs> and he said, that was a memorable day. Wow. And this was a very progressive person who mm-hmm. did this, who has, um, you know, came from a, from a privileged, you know, liberal family, mm-hmm. but still no one was doing it. And I don't, mm-hmm. I, I don't know that that many people are doing it right now, mm-hmm. but that was one of the seeds of the book. And it stuck with me. I just said, who would do that? But but interestingly, as I came to write the book, he did not become the main character. Mm. Now, if I could have written that book, but my 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 mind and my soul and my and my hands did not go there. Right. Not consciously. Uh, I, I went to a book club a couple of months ago, and people were lovely about the book, but many of them said. Why didn't you do this? And in every case, my answer was because it didn't occur to me. Mm, right. It's a, the simplest answer for that is, well, that did. I never thought of it. Right. I never thought of it. And mm. what the book is, is what I thought of. And what mm. the book is, is very revealing about me within those choices mm. rather than within the, 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 the subject or the facts. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, when, when an author, what an author chooses not to do tells you who the author is mm. often. And I may have made eccentric choices. You know, a couple of people said it should have been this. Oh, you should have geez. done it this way. And I and I say to, I said to them, and some of them, you know, I, I wrote back to, and I said, "That's the book you wish I had written, but it's not the book that I wrote. And I didn't write it to make you all riled up. I wrote it only because that's all I could think of." Mm. Yes, it's. You know, there's the quality we haven't mentioned about the way you wrote this book, which is so striking when you're reading it, but we have we haven't even touched on it, which is that all these characters we've mentioned, they take their turn turns narrating and, and two more do as well. Uh Wesley's mother and and her husband. When wh- how did was was that did that just happen when you were writing? And did it, where you just found yourself writing didn't. in the voices? It did and it didn't. Um I one of the things that I've always um uh felt was a strength of mine as a writer was my ear. Mm. And I've always, people have always mentioned that to me, you know, in, in, in my time as a screenwriter, that they could always tell the people apart. Mm. And I think that who knows where that came from. My parents have wonderful ears. Uh, but I think that growing up as a gay kid, like Theo in the book, that I learned how to listen because it was safer. I was, I was, from the safer place of not putting myself out there to be exposed and put in danger, I had to do something. Mm. So I listened. And I had the ability genetically. And um, so I just learned how different people sounded. So as I started to write this, this is how it emerged. Mm. 
Now, the book that I'm working on right now is not that way. Um, I mean, I feel like this gave me the confidence to not do that. But I, it was also, you know, for me, when I talk about confidence, it gave me a sense of security because I knew that I could inhabit the people through their first person mm. train of thought. Right. You professionally knew there, there's no greater strength for a television writer than this that I know I can do. Well, I've done it successfully. Writers, let, me, let me say. Mm. Um, I, I can't say that that's not how I thought of myself. Mm. I, I, really, what I, I, I'm a little defensive about that. I don't know why, because I'm very proud of the television that I did. Defensive about specifically which, which way of being seen. Writer, it's, I was very afraid as we were going out into the world with this book that people mm. would say, oh, he's just a dumb television oh, writer. Oh, they think of that as your, your identity, not just something that you've done, but yes. that you, he's, yes. he's a television writer. Yes, and this is partly the fault of the New York Times mm -hmm. that that um, reviewed me very patronizingly, <laughs> although although favorably. Oh. Uh, but you see, anybody who has spent five minutes in the state of California dare to do something that impinges on New York territory, oh. and they dismiss you immediately, oh. often with justification. Mm. But I was really worried about that, and you know, with the the the, the, uh, the you know the publicist from the publisher, I said, maybe I don't even want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But they said they're going to find out anyway, and uh, so I said, let's just go for it. But I thought that was going to hurt the book being seen as a book and not the book of a television writer, which implies a certain thinness. Mm -hmm in texture. Mm. Although, again, I'm very proud of the television stuff that I did, which I think was not thin in texture and was, was, was you know, fostered by people who cared about writing a great deal. Mm. You know, do, you speak, you, speaking of New York and the, the entering New York territory and then getting, the, getting a response from that, New York is not just a backdrop in this book. What's your background with New York City? I grew up there. Mm. Have, well, how long were you there? And, and what I suppose what uh, the question I always like to ask people who are here with careers now and grew up in New York is how, how do you see the division in, in, in your life between these two places? What's the, the fulcrum point between your New York life and your Los Angeles one? You know, do you want one city for growing up, one city for the career, or how does that work for you? Well, I mean, I've thought about differences so much over the years, and, and I spent some time living in New York while I was writing this um, because I wanted to uh, be in New York not as a tourist and not as a visitor. I wanted to know what it was like to wake up and have nothing to do well, yes, and nobody to see and no place to go, which is what, you know, an average life is. I mean, you don't have stuff every minute you do when you're in there for a week. What I've come up with now is that the difference between New York and Los Angeles is that in New in Los Angeles, people who go to New York complain about how cold it is, and in New York, nobody complains about how cold it is. <laughs> it's 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 sort of a complaint, you know, uh, nexus. Mm -hmm. But I, I I grew up in New York. I grew up actually on Long Island, but New York was a great release for me. You know, the story about uh, uh, again, I don't want to you know you know spoil anything, but there is a story about attending a matinee of a show that is very central mm. to the character of George that appears at the end of the book that happened to me. Mm. Uh, and the book is set in an area, which is the theater district, that was very potent for me uh, and very romantic for me and very much sort of a fantasy place for me that I spent a lot of time in mm. as a kid. Uh, but I left New York. I went to college and I graduated from college and I lived in New York for three years uh, before I moved to Los Angeles, where I have lived for 36 years. And I have only very recently stopped thinking of myself as a New Yorker. <laughs> and and one of the – and in a funny way, somebody said, you wrote this book so you would stop talking about should you move back to New York or not. Oh, that was the question. And, yeah, that was the mm. question. And I don't ask myself that question anymore. Mm. Um, but one of the things that I have been really interested in is people saying to me, oh, it's so New York now. I haven't got a clue what New York now is. <laughs> this is the New York of my fantasy. Right. With texting. Maybe that's what they mean. With texting, texting, yeah. Yeah, with texting. 
But and when I started writing this, I wasn't I wasn't texting. No. You know, and people would say, I tried to text you, you know, I was gonna be late. And I, I now I didn't have the habit to take my phone with me. <laughs> now I do. Right. I mean, these aren't just texting kids. I mean, fifteen year olds do it in the book, sixty year olds do it in the book as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So you this is communication and you they, realize they, that. They have they have they have dropped their resistance <laughs> because they know they have to. Right. You know, and in a way that sort of resounds through the book is it's about what you drop your resistance to because you mm. don't have a choice. Mm. Mm. You know, there's, I, I can't help, but I, th- I think of this, I think of New York and cities and characters and situations where they have no choice. Mm-hmm. And I look at the copy of the book we have over there, Christopher Sherwood's A yes. Single Man, yes. which we talked about before rolling because it's my personal favorite Los Angeles novel and it's a novel you love as well and, and read several times as I understand it well, during the course of writing these things happen. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with with a single man. How far back does that go with Isherwood's novel? Well, I, I my relationship with Isherwood really goes back to knowledge of him from having seen Cabaret. Mm. You know, which which um, I was taken to see as um, uh, an eleven year old on Broadway in the original cast of it, and so that was how the name came into my head. Mm. And then when I was first living out here, I was taken to meet him. Oh. By uh, a friend of mine who who had I'd known in New York who came out here said do you want to go meet Chris and Don mm-hmm. uh, and I was taken to Chris and Don's uh, Don being Don Bacardi obviously to their house in Santa Monica Canyon for dinner where um, I had um, I, I mean this kindly but I had the misfortune of being uh, seated at the end of the table with Don while Christopher Isherwood was at the other end of the table going on and about, oh, the woman who was Sally Bowles was da-da-da-da, you know, and and Auden said to me, and da-da-da-da, and and Don just didn't have that kind of conversation. Mm. But uh, I used to see them at every movie. When there were still revival houses here, Mm -hmm. they were everywhere, and I would always talk to them. The revival houses are back. There's more. There's the Cine family in, in West Hollywood or Where? the new uh, Fairfax, Fairfax Avenue uh, and Melrose. I go there quite often. You can buy a cheap membership there. They, they bring a lot of movies back. Oh, that's good. That's, is that the old silent movie theater? It is. It's the old silent movie theater. Oh, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. Well, I, there used to be a million of them yeah. here and, uh, and they were always there. Mm. And um, but I this is I, I have a copy of this um, signed by him. I remember there was once uh, when there were still gay bookstores. Mm. Uh, he used to sign things all the time, and I have a signed copy of first edition of Berlin Stories yeah, that is right. inscribed to me. That is one of my treasures. But this book, um, I probably read it for the first time twenty years ago, and it just as a piece of writing, it's extraordinary. It is, you know, it's it's like reading his diaries, but better, I think. Uh, you know, certainly shorter. Certainly shorter. Yes, um, you read him, and suddenly, for three minutes, you're as smart as him, mm-hmm. and you're as clear as him. And reading him is like taking a pill for me. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and because it makes me briefly see things with his clarity that I can't do on my own. And I think that's a wonderful use to put a great writer to. Mm. Now, you, you have a passage in here that's particularly relevant to, to, to these book. things happen. Yes, yes. and it's, it's from a part, it? indeed, if, if you feel like this is the moment, this is from, if you're familiar with the novel, readers, it's, it's from a, a section where we see the main character named George teaching at uh, his, his uh, he, he teaches at, at uh, Cal... Cal State Los Angeles, correct? Yes. yes. And, uh, and that's based on Isherwood. In, indeed. And he's, he's got – he says something in particular to his students and, and here it is. Well, it's funny. I just have to say this thing is, you yes, know, my main character is named George too. And I think that possibly that that's – I got the name from a single man. Oh, yes. Without even realizing it. I could, could well – I could well believe it. So here is George and um, I, I'll give you a little tiny preview of how this resounds in These Things Happen – is, um, maybe I won't, maybe I'll just read this first. (laughs) He's teaching his class and he says, he's talking about minorities and he's, and and he is a minority. He is a gay man whose partner, although it wasn't called partners then, they didn't even have a name then, has, has he committed suicide or or it's unclear? He's died in a a car wreck. Yes, with some question about whether it was suicide or not. And so he is mourning he is a single man. Mm. Um, and, um, so he's talking to his class of kids and he's saying, so let's face it, 
Minorities are people who probably look and act and think differently from us and have faults we don't have. We may dislike the way they look and act, and we may hate their faults. And it's better if we admit to disliking and hating them than if we try to smear our feelings over with pseudo-liberal sentimentality. If we're frank about our feelings, we have a safety valve. And if we have a safety valve, we're actually less likely to start persecuting. I know that theory is unfashionable nowadays. We all keep trying to believe that if we ignore something long enough, it'll just vanish. Mm. And there's a bit of feeling smearing going on in your book as well, as they're not. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And that, if I could have, you know, if I could have gathered the characters in my book in a room, you know, before writing this, I would have given them a copy of this book with those lines, un, you know, underlined. In Required reading. And I wouldn't have had to write the book. Mm. Mm. Um, but that is... That must have made a bigger impact on me than I knew because I remembered it mm. and I brought it here today. Mm. And I pulled this off the shelf last night. Mm. And I have not read this now for a couple of years. But why did that stick with me? Well, it finds its way into this book. Mm. Now, tell me if this is plausible to you, but I think of these these notions of, well, first of all, that, that liberal feeling smearing. But, you know, now... We have characters in this book in, in 2013, especially in New York, who would say we're, we're living in the most liberal, permissive, accepting era that's ever been in America. And I think of the eras that fans of the shows you've worked on think of as emblematizing you know, my so-called life in the 90s or 30-something in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. Both of those eras, I, I would imagine at the time, people were saying, this is the most liberal, permissive era we've ever been in. And mm -hmm. you know, I feel like that just... Does that sentiment just keep echoing itself, maybe with decreasing I, I falseness? So. Or I, I think so. I mean, I think that 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 it's 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 very hard to to. I think it's a, it's a story that people need to tell themselves about the time that they're living in, mm. or about themselves, because it's comforting to feel that you are uh, not even just on the cutting edge, but that you are um, a, a good person who embodies your time. And I think that, you know, the people do the best they can. Um, you know, there was, there was, uh, I was just, um, uh, at Yale last week where I went to school and I taught a class on, on these things happen. And, uh, the kids, you know, I mean, I started college in 1970 and the kids said, well, what, you know, did you all know about Stonewall and all that stuff? You know, Obama, you know, mentioned it in his second inaugural address. And I said, we didn't even know what it was. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, nobody knew anything like that. You never know what's significant until 30 or 40 years later. Mm. And, and it, it could be happening in your house. Right. And you don't know it. You could know it goes on, but you don't know to, to, to note even. it down. Right. Not yeah. Even. Maybe you heard at the gay bookstore, Stonewall went on. Not even. <laughs> Who would go to a gay bookstore? They didn't have them. Uh. You know, in, in 1970, we're talking pre-gay bookstores, pre-everything. Mm. You know, so and people, you know, say, "Oh, what was it like?" It was you, you didn't think about what it was like then, mm. and you know, you can romanticize it as you look back or demonize it as you look back. But you know, it was funny when I was at Yale, I looked around and it was as if I had never been there a day in my life, <laughs> and I was there for years. Yeah. You know, it was uh, it seemed huge to me for one thing. And uh, if you had, you know, if you had put me down on a street corner there in 1971 and blindfolded me, I could have found my way to any place mm. that you told me you wanted me to go. Mm. I felt the opposite and uh, unblindfolded. You know, I didn't know where I was. I didn't have my bearings. Mm. And somebody said, you know, that that's because in those years you were living your life. You weren't looking at it. It's the same thing about, you know, uh, uh, things that define an era. If you're in the era, you're not looking at it. Mm. We have the adult characters and these things happen. Look at the, the young kid, the 15-year-old Wesley, and they, they sort of think, oh, he can't see where he is in life. Mm -hmm. But I can see it because I was there. I don't know how right you think these adults are about that. Well, I think the one adult who is most, in a way, he's the one who is least involved in the one who is the most empathic or whatever mm -hmm. the word is. I always think it's empathic. So that, that, say, that's the word. Yeah. Not empathetic. Um, who is his stepfather? Mm -hmm. Um, who is a man named Ben, who is, um, uh, who I now visualize as somebody like Rob Reiner today, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, or Albert Brooks, mm -hmm. who is a Menchie guy in his mid to late sixties, 
who has had success in life, who has been through it all twice, and who has who is funny, wise, warm, and available as needed. And he sees this kid in a very true and loving way, in a way that his own mother has a harder time with because she's significantly younger mm-hmm. and, and and she has Wesley in her hand like a robin's egg. You know, she, although she is also, uh, one of the things that I love about the mother, I hope we get to talk about her, about Lola, is that she has let him go. You know, the spring of the story is that he comes to her and says, I want to live with dad because I want dad to get to know me as a man. Mm. And she has not said no, despite all of her misgivings. And despite the fact that she doubts that it will go well, Mm. she has not stood in the way of her kid, nor has she abandoned her responsibility. Mm. You know, I mean, he comes home to them on weekends and she is ready to crack down the minute something you know, things start to go awry, but she wants him to have his his own sense of identity. Mm. You know, we we haven't talked directly about this chapter where you write in the voice of Lola, where, where yeah. it's the chapter that Lola narrates, but she she is racked with protective impulses during this chapter. And I wonder, you know, the she's clearly a competent character and 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 her husband Ben is is uh, the, he thinks the world of her clearly, but in that chapter, her voice it seems like writing writing her. Did you did you think you you were running the risk, or you wanted you wanted to avoid you wanted to show her turmoil internally, but you wanted to avoid making her sound overtly unappealing? I mean, it I seems like to be a bitch, right? Yes, you know. Although she has certain. She was the hardest one to write and the most fun (laughs) because I fell in love with her Mm. and I, I thought her simultaneously awful and admirable. Mm -hmm. And she is paradoxical because she partakes of some of the most horrible attributes that I think a person can partake of. And I also think that she is completely cool. Mm. I, 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 and I, I just sort of had to sit back and, and let her tell her story and, 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 and announce herself to me because I, I went into her, into her voice with no notion of where it would lead me. And it led me to some places that I didn't feel happy about oh. and that nobody else does. But it also led me away from that aspect of her and i think that i think that she and the father she and her ex-husband kenny are the bravest people in the book because mm-hmm. they have to confront things about themselves that they have never faced and they do it and they acknowledge it and they do not fall apart mm-hmm. do you think these confrontations these internal confrontations are inevitable inevitable for people in life or do some do many or some or any go to their grave just never Never facing up to well, themselves. That's what the title means. You know, I mean, when these things happen, you know, which is which was a, a a title that God gave me, uh, whether people like it or not. Most people seem to because it's a colloquialism. Mm-hmm. I think a colloquialism that also dramatizes my belief that I hope to convey in the book is that when these things, if these things happen, you are lucky. If these things happen that lead you to this realization about yourself, no matter how upsetting it is, you have lived a fortunate life. Mm. And I don't think that these things happen in every life. And I think it's possible to have a perfectly good life without these things happening. Mm. But without these things happening, you don't have a book. Mm. You know, this, this, these types of crises that, that get people facing how they perceive themselves and how they're actually perceived. These these happen in, in these things happen. Uh, if that sentence makes sense, with without their without it being life and death, some, some people get roughed up in the course of the book. Uh, a character has died before the book begins, but you know, no one no one is life isn't hanging in the balance in any sort of heightened dramatic way. You 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 you're able to you get drama out of you get drama without having to 
go over the top. Was that a concern for you? You didn't you didn't want to you didn't want to put any big implausible bomb in the in the sort of social action of this book and in, in, in sort of the in the family action. I mean, there's it's there's a lot of the characters have to do some soul searching, no doubt. But you didn't have to. You didn't have to go to an unrealistic place to get there. Does that make sense? A big tangled it question. It, it does. I mean, you know, I mean, in in future books, you know, should I have the the energy and good luck to write them? I, I'd like to try something else. Mm. Uh, in this book, this book is about sort of the, the the play of private feeling. I mean, there is a dramatic event in it. Um, but during 30 something, we, we, uh, I worked with a, uh, one of my fellow writers was a Virginia Woolf fanatic Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, who did beautiful work on the, on the show. And her name was Susan Shilliday, still is Susan Shilliday. And she quoted, uh, something from Virginia Woolf's, I think it was from her diaries or from her journals or something like that. She said, she said, I am not concerned with the larger movements of life, but with the little moves nearer to people that people are able to make. Mm. And that's, I so affected me at the time. And I really feel in a way I've brought to this book without even being aware of it. Um, you know, the people who wanted me to write another book wanted me to do a whole thing about, you know, pursuing the people who commit the heinous act that, that I don't want to specify here, you know, the, 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 the malefactors yes, and, you know, yes. bringing there, them there to justice. Bad guys, I guess there could there be bad guys, guys but there. we don't talk about them really. And we never meet them. No. I mean, they are only perceived through, um, their victims. Mm. And there was a, a, a period where, where I was working, you know, just giving pages of this to somebody. And he said, why don't you have the father get involved this way and do this with the bad people? And I tried it and it just didn't hold in these pages. So this this the book is, among other things, you know, it's about the play of consciousness um, of the, in all of the characters' heads, and they're very present people. They're not checked out. I mean, it's not Benji and the Sound of the Fury, and it's not Mrs. Dalloway. You know, these are people who are very involved in the moment to momentness of their life. Right. But you know, the 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 first person thing is we are privy to a thing that we cannot be privy to in drama, which is their moment to moment perception of thought and what they see that they cannot reveal to others. So the book, as I was working on, I said, this is a very private story and that what I'm able to give the readers, if there ever are any readers, is a sense of the privacy, what happens in the private lives of each of these people as they're dealing with each other. Mm. No, I, I think back to my own life as a 15 year old and before and even even slightly after and and how many adults... I guess this is the condition of the American 15-year-old as adults are trying to give you guidance or think they should or they're convinced that they know exactly what's going on with you. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but the confusion, as I recall it, was always you, you don't know which ones are right and wrong. If you did, it would be a lot simpler. If they were all right, you could obey all adults and you could follow all their advice. If they were all wrong, you could ignore them all. But is that familiar at all to you from your memories of that age where you just didn't know who was right? Absolutely. I don't think that you ever do. And, you know, I think that, w- that one of the things, you know, f- to me, the joy of the book, uh, and I, and I, I could, I, 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 I never got tired of writing it. And I, I, the, I, chapters and chapters and chapters that I didn't use mm. was the relationship between Wesley, the teenage boy and his father's boyfriend, George, mm who is the one who transmits to Wesley the information and the knowledge of life that is most valuable to him. And he does it in the most unselfconscious way. And what creates the crisis of the book is Wesley's overattachment mm. to George, because Wesley is looking for somebody to help him navigate what is to come, whether he knows that or not. Yeah. And George is looking to be a navigator whether he knows that or not. And so that was, those scenes were, were, you know, let's just say it, they were easy to write. Oh, easy. Yeah, they were easy to write. They were a joy to write. Mm, they and were I, natural to write. They were natural to write. Mm. They were natural to write. And I, one of the reasons that I like Wesley as a character 
is that I like what he's looking for. He is, and again, this is whether he knows it or not, although it does get spelled out, is he is looking to find out the, what, are the, what, what are the various kinds of love. And I'm not talking about in, within sexual categories, mm-hmm. um, and, but it is spelled out at the end of the book. But what are the various forms that love takes as he gets ready to love in his own life? And the first person he loves, I don't want to ruin anything here, is contained within the pages of this book, mm. who he loves separately from filial love. Mm. Mm. Who it's, and it becomes something that, that, that it's this person upsets the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> yes. But it is genuine love. Mm. LARB readers will know a little bit about this, but tell me about the guidance that Pauline Kale gave you. Well, you know, she was, um, there used to be a, 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 a way to talk about somebody that I don't know is still around, but, but, uh, she was a pistol. <laughs> Haven't heard that in a little while. Yeah. And she, but she was just always smoking, you know, I mean, <laughs> she was, um, uh, and she, uh, gave me, I mean, I met her when I was 16 years old from, I wrote her a letter. I had been in a uh, a filmmaking class in summer school, uh, and her first book was out, and it was one of our texts, and it, it blew me away. And I just, you know, it was like, you know, each word in that book was a bullet with my name on it. And I, there are many people who that was true for with her, I've discovered, particularly since that piece came out. But I, she lived in New York, and I wrote her a letter. I mean, I still believe in writing people letters. And she responded to it. And then, uh, uh, and she welcomed me as a Wesley into mm. her life. Mm. And she brought to me a picture of adulthood that I would not have had otherwise. I mean, she was living a, uh, 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 an, an intellectual's, she was living an intellectual show business life in New York, and it was very, very intoxicating. And she was generous with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she was even better to me when, while I was in college, uh, the New Yorker took some work of mine. And so then I was a colleague, mm-hmm. and she had nothing to do with it. So she, you know, she, she felt really, really proud of me. And until she died, I mean, I write about this in the piece, she was always available. Mm-hmm. For however much I needed, and she, you know, and and I think that that in some ways, you know, uh, George is the same. I mean, I should call George George Kale, you know, because which would not be a bad name for him. Um, she she was there to for me to test things on, mm-hmm. and often I was wrong. <laughs> and she would not be afraid to tell me. You she know, didn't I mean, seem to be too fond of the first pieces you showed her no, of movie no, no, criticism no, no. you'd written. No, but she was direct and honest. Mm. So she never – from the beginning, I trusted her. Mm. So when I finally started to produce a couple of things that, that she liked, I believed her. Mm. And that relationship uh, is is in a way what George's and Wesley's relationship is. George is very real with Wesley. Mm. There's this we, – we, we need a combination when young of, of – yeah, di, di, availability, as you've said, and also just, just enough distance, just enough? Yes. There was, there was never – she was she – was, one of the things, George is extremely conscious of boundaries mm. uh, because he knows that as a gay man in the presence of a teenage boy, he is ripe for the pickings, <laughs> you know, that George is, is a target. Mm, that's it. They're, they're sort of what's, what's the what's the phrase a fox in the hen house he's well not just that but he is at risk mm. or uh, being perceived that way absolutely yeah. absolutely mm. and many men who have read the book have told me they didn't realize how conscious they are of that in the presence of what are we 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 describe as the innocent Mm. Which I think is something that is is uh, 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 an interesting concept. What we consider innocence, mm. but um, George is hyper aware of that, and not even hyper aware that he's hyper aware of it. Mm. There's there's there is quite a bit of 
awareness without awareness of the awareness without meta awareness, you might say yes. in the characters here. Yes. I had to be very careful with that mm -hmm. because, you know, I wanted to, you know, one of the things that we were often accused of on 30, something that I have been accused of in this book, mm -hmm. but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, I mean, I'm interested. I mean, there, there uh, have been critical responses that really interested me. You know, there was one I came across today where somebody said that, the, the, the book, every character in the book was an exquisite Richard Kramer and how much she wanted to know me, but she didn't believe that the people were real. Oh. And I wrote back to her and I said, that's one of the most interesting responses that anybody has given me. And I'm actually grateful mm. that you, that you were, that you, I don't think, know if she was right or wrong, mm. but, um, I was fascinated by that. But, um, there's the, the, the awareness, the challenge for me here was to write about the consciousness of somebody who was not conscious of their consciousness, right, yeah. you know, and, and with the 30 something characters, they were all conscious of their consciousness. And that was what those who loved the show loved about it mm. because we were that way. Mm. And so we were able to, to represent that and to, and to characterize that. But George, you know, I, I'm always interested in, in, in the work of Oscar Hammerstein mm -hmm. because, you know, so much of, of lyric writing is about highly sophisticated um, uh, uh, perceptions of the world. You know, I mean, that's certainly the case with Cole Porter and with, with uh, a little bit less so with Irving Berlin, but with Cole Porter and, and Lorenz Hart, uh, certainly with Stephen Sondheim. And Oscar Hammerstein, who was more sophisticated than all of them put together, always set himself the challenge of writing f from the point of view of people who were fundamentally inarticulate. Hmm. And I don't think that George is inarticulate, but he's not a profound thinker. He's a profound liver. Hmm. And he, he almost would rather see himself as somebody who can quote show tunes than who can quote yes, Foucault or whomever. Uh, he didn't even know who Foucault is <laughs> and more power to him, <laughs> you know, and all the people around him do, mm. and he doesn't care, mm. but he still feels a little bit less than, and he diminishes himself to Wesley and Wesley won't put up with it. I was going to, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of questions you can ask about that that are very simple saying, for example, who do you see as the, as the most changed character in the book? But geez, I don't really know. You've, you've managed to, you've, you've accrued a lot of total character change in this whole, in, in this whole story. I mean, who doesn't, does anybody not change? They all do. Yeah. And they all do in different ways. Yeah. And they do in ways that are my ways, mm. you know? And one of the things that was, that was so much fun about writing this was that when you write a script, a TV show or a screenplay, everybody has an opinion. <laughs> everybody wants it that you have to follow. <laughs> uh, contradictory most of the time, right? Well, and also not very rich mm. or interesting. And these are my ways mm. for better or for worse. I don't say that they're, that, that they're, they're right or wrong, but they're mine. Mm. And just an answer of the question, who changes the most? I would say the father. Mm, this is Kenny, the, uh, the lawyer and f acceptable face of gay America. Yes. Who, who feels deeply at unease in the world, Pardon me, deeply uneasy. And he is the one who I think, makes this the, the the greatest leap mm. and it's a tiny moment um that happens towards the end of the book but he is the one who goes from zero to ten mm. all the way yeah <laughs> yeah i've been speaking would, would you agree well, let's see here. I'm, you don't have to, but but he certainly tries. I'm thinking of any possible reasons to disagree, but it brings up it brings up the question of what that how that interacts with his public persona. How is the the change on the inside versus the change on on the face that shows up on Charlie Rose? You know what I mean? I think that Kenny. You know, people ask me, uh, and again, I don't want to. Um, uh, give too much away because I really want people to read the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that I want to stress about the book uh, is that the book is an entertaining read. We've talked about it in terms of, you know, Foucault and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and several things that seem heady, but the book, it, 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 the book is an entertainment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and one of the things that I take pleasure in is giving people pleasure and that people laugh at this gives me joy because I wanted them to, uh, in a way I'm like George in that way. I want to give them a pleasant evening. That is George's mission in life is to give people a pleasant evening that they wouldn't have had otherwise. I am like him in that. But um, I've completely forgotten what I started to say. <laughs> what, what was I saying? I was talking about Kenny again. Mm-hmm. Oh, how this would change him. Yes. yes. In public. Yes. Well, people ask me, do I think they're going to stay together? And I say, I hope so, but I don't know. Mm. What do you think? Well, you know, it's – you you do you do get the moment in the book. Every reader gets the moment where they think these these two aren't going to go the distance. But ideally, with a couple like that, I finish a book not knowing. I finish I finish it with them in an ambiguous place, Great. and they have here. I I don't know if every reader wants that. Maybe they do, but it's what Many, I want. Some some don't. Oh, I see. Some don't. And 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 you know, I wish I could write a book that satisfied. You know, if I write 10 more books, which is highly unlikely, uh, I would like to have a different kind of reader be satisfied with with each one of them. Mm. I'm satisfied with ambiguity. Mm. And I didn't think, how am I going to make this ambiguous as I was writing it? It just came out that way because that's what I like. Mm. And that's the kind of story that I like. I like a story that in the very last moment, everything is up for grabs. Mm. Everything. Here in Los Angeles Review of Books headquarters, I've been speaking with Richard Kramer, who is the author of the new novel, his first novel, These Things Happen. Richard, thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Colin. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find much more at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks.